Heavenly Father, we want to give you thanks for the grace of being able to gather in the house of God as one family. Father, as we look to your word, we ask that you open up our hearts and our minds to understand your faithfulness and the forgiveness that you have for us, Lord. We commit this sermon into your hands. Holy Spirit, you lead us and guide us. In Jesus' most precious name we pray. Amen, amen. So, church, good morning. Morning, yeah. Um, okay, I know I sound a bit uh, different today, right? Yeah, I hope I sound better. No, no. I thought I sound like Sean Connery. <laughs> right, okay, I had my tooth extracted, uh, and then following that, as I was getting healed for my extraction, I got, I had sore throat, cough, and then runny nose. La. So, like they say, right, when it rains, it pours, so everything comes together. La. So, but bear with me, my voice. Um, I pray that God will continue to minister to us. So, today, um, just a little follow up from last week's uh, sermon that Pastor Glenn preached on the wisdom that uh, Solomon was uh, blessed with. So, we are continuing that. Uh, uh, together at 1 Kings chapter 8. Uh, so, um, so finally, as we know, the temple of God is completed because uh, David wanted to build, but then the Lord said, no, I'm asking Solomon to build the temple. So Solomon, in the end, he, he builds uh, the temple. It is completed. And then what Solomon does is he brings the Ark of the Covenant into the sanctuary of the temple that he just built. And uh, so the... the uh, the ark, as we all know, is a symbol of God's presence uh, with his people. Uh, and it is to be placed in the inner sanctuary, right? Uh, the most holy place. Uh, the holy place, the outer sanctuary, the most holy place. Holy place and most holy. So they place it in the most holy place. And under the wings of the cherubim, right? As we will see. Right, okay. Right? We're supposed to be placed under uh, the wings of the cherubim. So, uh, 1 Kings chapter 8 tells us uh, that Solomon, what he did was King Solomon, he summoned all the leaders uh, of his kingdom and the elders, uh, the heads of tribes, the chiefs of families, the heads of families, and together they escorted the ark into the temple. So, there was a big celebration, there was a ceremonial uh, walk into the temple bringing the ark. So, the priests, they were uh, tasked with carrying the ark. And then the Levites, uh, they brought the tent of meeting and all the other sacred furnishings into the sanctuary. Uh, it says here in 1 Kings chapter 8, uh, verse... All right. All right. 10, 11. And then uh, we see that uh, when the priest withdrew from the holy place, the cloud, the cloud filled the temple of the Lord. And the priests could not perform their service because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord filled the temple. So a cloud came upon that place. And we, this is not the first time it has happened. We see this same phenomenon uh, happening at uh, Exodus. All right. It uh, happened when Moses completed the tabernacle. The scripture tells us that the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. So the cloud is visible. <coughs> Excuse me. The cloud is visible. The cloud is a sign of God's presence. Uh, his glory fills the temple. See, no man can see God. Right? No man can see God. But man can see the visible sign of God's presence. And that was the cloud. So Solomon praised God. We see that in 1 Kings uh, 8, uh, chapter 8, verse 14 and 21. He then, uh, Solomon then stands before the altar of the Lord in front of the whole assembly of uh, Israel and offers this prayer of dedication that uh, Edwin just read for us from 1 Kings chapter 8. He prays this prayer. So two things, uh, two things we can reflect upon from uh, what uh, Solomon prayed, this prayer of dedication. And emphasis on God's faithfulness. First one is on God's faithfulness, right? So when Solomon... So when Solomon first praised God, his words were, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel who with his own hands has fulfilled what he promised with his own mouth to my father David. And then again, he says God kept his promise. That the Lord has kept the promise he made. And then in the prayer, 
He says, O Lord, God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above or on earth below. You who keep your covenant of love with your servants who continue wholeheartedly in your way. You have kept your promise to your servant David, my father. With your mouth you have promised and with your hand you have fulfilled it as it is today. Again, God kept his promise, uh, his covenant of love to Israel and his word to David. Again, the words, right? It says, with his mouth he promised. God with his mouth he promised and with his hand he fulfilled that promises. So God said it. And then he did it. God said and he did it. So ours is a promise-keeping God. What he says, he will do. He promised and he performed, right? as we see today also. So Solomon praises God for his uh, faithfulness, testifying that it is God who uh, establishes, right? And, uh, and in God, there is strength. God did it. So the first thing that we do is we recognize God's faithfulness. Uh, at such a special moment when uh, dedicating the magnificent temple of God, right? Uh, we don't know exactly how it was built. We can't see that right now. But it, is, it was magnificent. Right? Solomon could have, uh, as building it, Solomon could have uh, reflected or thought about or even, even recounted <clears throat> all the years of hard work that was put in, into building this temple of God. Right? The amount of resources, we all know a like, huge building, the amount of resources that was poured in, the efforts that were put in, and the many skilled laborers engaged to just build this building. And uh, from David's time, you know, until when Solomon dedicates the, table, uh, the, te uh, the temple, right, building his temple, so he could have reflected and see, wow, we did all these things. I remember when uh, in my home church, when we were rebuilding from a single-story building, we built to a four-story building. Right, it was a tremendous experience, a lot of work, a lot of effort, a lot of financial resources, manpower, a lot of work had to be put in. And when that building was done, we had this ah, amazing, right, for us to build it. So uh, a lot of effort was put into building the temple of God. Solomon, uh, of course, has reasons to be proud of his efforts. And because he is the one who got everything going together and he, he led the whole thing, so he had reasons. And... I'm not sure exactly how many years, but it was, I think it's about seven years of hard work, and now this great achievement, right, is completed after all the struggle. And yet, and yet Solomon, the only thing he sees in this whole building, the completion of the building, right, the achievement, right, the only thing he sees is the faithfulness of God. He sees the faithfulness of God in all of this, and he is grateful, Solomon is grateful for that. He did not assume that this was uh, the result of his capability or his wise planning or because of the wisdom that he was uh, given, nor his talents or great uh, leadership or the resources that were at his disposal. You know, he, wasn't, he didn't assume that it was, it was because of that. But then again, which can be true, right? Uh, looking at his great building, we look at it, yeah. He can boast and say, well, a lot of people were involved, a lot of time and money, and I had to get everything organized and all that. He could have boasted about his achievements. He could have, but you know, he didn't. I remember recently, uh, the concluded, uh, recently concluded Olympics, right? If you have watched it, uh, Christian athletes especially, those who did very well, you know, they have put in a lot of effort, a lot of personal discipline, a lot of time, money spent, you know, and a lot of challenges, a lot of struggles, a lot of setbacks, and then they overcame all that, and then they won. And if you listen to their interviews, every one of them that I heard, they always gave glory to God and said, this was possible because of God. They didn't say my effort, my discipline, my training. They didn't say, they said, it was purely because of God and God's grace. And, then, and, and, and the same thing with uh, what Solomon was saying also. Solomon sees the hand of God in all that he has achieved so far. He acknowledges God's faithfulness in that achievement. So my friends, do we see God's hands in all that we have achieved? I'm sure we have achieved much. Right? Do we see God's hands, both as individuals and as a church? Right? Do we see God's hands in all that we have achieved? And I pray that, uh, we, that, we, that we see the same today and acknowledge the goodness and faithfulness of God in our own lives. Without Him, my friends, we will not be where we are today. And that is something we must learn to acknowledge. It's not about how great we are, but how good God has been. So, in a way, our achievements are truly God's achievements. 
if you understand that carefully. So this, this acknowledgement is crucial because it reminds us that every achievement, no matter how grand, how great, is ultimately uh, a testament to God's promises and faithfulness. Solomon's recognition that it is God who has fulfilled his word uh, highlights the, uh, the importance of seeing God's hand in our own successes and achievements. See, the temple is not just a physical structure. Uh, it is a symbol of God's faithfulness to his people. God kept his word. He said, I will do this, and I did it. God's faithfulness to his people. So Solomon reflects on how God has fulfilled his promise by allowing the temple to be built. So this place... The temple that Solomon built has to be a constant reminder of God's presence and his commitment to his covenant with Israel, that God will keep his promises. So friends, when we see our lives, our own personal lives, do we see God's faithfulness? Are we grateful? Or are we always complaining? Eh? The Singaporeans are very well known for complaining, right? We complain just about everything. Weather hot, we complain. Rain, also we complain, Right? Too much food, we complain. Not enough food, also we complain. We are, we are an expert, right? So are we always complaining and grumbling about our situation and fail to see that all, is God, all that God is doing in our lives? I want to do an exercise now. Okay, every one of you, close your eyes. Don't fall asleep. Eh? Close your eyes. Right? And I want you to recall this. All the good things in your life that God has done. Your blessings your achievements? Do you see God's faithfulness in all this? Or have you taken them for granted? Will you take this time to just give thanks to God for His faithfulness? Not just in things received, but in how He has seen you through so many things and has brought you to where you are today. Yes, some of us could be in a very difficult situation today. Could be going through pain, struggle, disappointments. But I'm sure you're able to look beyond that situation and see his faithfulness. Can we just take a moment? Will you give thanks to God for his faithfulness? Will you acknowledge? His faithfulness to us. Okay, you can open your eyes now. Right, so once again, good morning. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> <coughs> so continue to do this. Now. Continue to remember God's faithfulness in our lives. So Solomon's recognition of God's faithfulness says is a powerful lesson for us today, right? It calls us to acknowledge God's role in our lives. So just as Solomon acknowledged uh, God's role in the, in the completion of the temple, we are called to recognize and thank God for his role in our lives and achievements. It also calls us to trust in God's promises. Solomon's prayer invites us to trust in God's promises and to see his hand at work in our lives. Even when we face challenges, we can be assured that God's promises are steadfast. I met, uh, just recently, uh, I met two interesting people uh, this, just this week as I was preparing this sermon. So uh, one of them was my former youth, well, one of the young lady now, a former youth uh, girl, now married with children. And then she was telling, telling me how challenging it was for her the last few years. First, I know her dad. Her dad had went through a major, major uh, brain operation and then he had to be taken care of and she was the main caregiver. As a daughter, she was caregiver. She was telling me how she went through a difficult time and she was almost suicidal during that period. And then she overcame that. And then she got married. And then uh, just a few months ago, she gave birth to a beautiful daughter. And during that pregnancy, she had a very difficult pregnancy. And then she was saying uh, it was so bad that the doctor gave her an ultimatum. You choose. In this pregnancy, who lives, you or your child? She had to go there. She was just sharing with me that. She said, you had to choose. Either you or your child. It was that bad. It was so frightening for her, very scary. But you know what? God saw her through. And both uh, survived <clears throat> that pregnancy and both are alive and well today. And talking to her, she had no bitterness, she had no anger. And all she said was, 
God has been faithful to me. In this pain that she had to go through, uh, she saw God's faithfulness. And that is what we, I want to encourage us also. Sometimes we go through difficulties and we go through challenges and struggles. But you know what? When we look closely, we can see God's faithfulness. We can see God's hands in our situation. And she saw, and she saw that. I was so encouraged. I was preparing this sermon to speak to her also. And what happens next is Solomon goes on to pray for forgiveness, forgiveness of God. <clears throat> uh, he says in the verse, uh, tw- uh, 1 Kings 27, 27 to 30 in the verses, right, he says, one thing he says, plea for mercy, right? And then he also prays, the last one you see, your dwelling place, and when you hear, Lord forgive. So Solomon is now praying for mercy. He's pleading to God for mercy. See, Solomon's prayer is marked by a deep plea for forgiveness. Not just superficial, right? So despite the grandeur of the temple, despite how big the temple was built, right, and how God used Solomon, Solomon understands that the temple cannot contain God. The temple cannot contain God. He understands that. And that the human, and that uh, human sin, right, it necessitates God's forgiveness, divine forgiveness. So he prays. He says, hear the cry and prayer that your servant is praying in your presence this day. So Solomon's plea is not only for the people of Israel, but for anyone who turns to God in repentance. I'm sorry. My apologies. Yeah. Solomon's prayer acknowledges the reality of human sin, right? And the need for forgiveness. He recognizes that even with the temple, people are still in need of God's mercy and grace. Although this temple is a place of God, a place for God to dwell in, uh, so that's just figuratively speaking, eh? because Solomon knows God cannot be uh, confined to a building made with hands, with human hands. So Solomon confesses the, um, if you can say, the uncontainability of God. That God cannot be boxed in, you know, he cannot be contained just within the temple. So that's the greatness and the majesty of God, if you can understand that. He dwells in heaven, right? We sang just now, and then Pastor Glenn also was leading us, right, in time of repentance, you know, forgiving our sins and all that. God dwells in heaven, right? Where he is, where his presence is, is heaven to all of us. And yet, this great God who is in heaven, right, so majestic, this great God hears the prayers of men in this place. How amazing, isn't it? Right? This God, the amazing, majestic God, hears our prayers. Here's your prayers and my prayer. So when, 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 men, when men seek God uh, in this place, God hears from heaven. See, Solomon started off this prayer with himself, right? He said, when your servant prays, And then the prayers of his people, Israel, he prays for them. And finally, he prays even for the foreigners who come from the distant lands. We see that in uh, 1 Kings 8.41. He says, when they come to this temple and pray, Lord, hear from heaven, Lord, you hear their prayers. This here is mentioned many times throughout the prayer that Solomon prays. God hears from heaven the cries of the people, and when they come seeking God in this place. See, God, as we all know, is... um, God is, what we say, transcendent, right? That means he's everywhere. He cannot be contained. He cannot be uh, uh, boxed up in one place uh, beyond anything that you and I could imagine or think, you know. We cannot imagine fully God's presence. We cannot even think about it. Uh, We can't dream, right? He's transcendent. He's everywhere. He's omnipotent, right? He's omnipresent. He's omniscient. He's everything. And yet, and yet, this God is available for you and me. But this amazing God, you know, right? He is, he cannot be contained and yet he's accessible for you and me. Right? His, he, his transcendence eh, uh, does, not, does not hinder or limit our intimacy with God just because he's so powerful, he's so uh, omnipresent, he's everywhere, right? He's so all-consuming, all-powerful. That doesn't mean we cannot be intimate with God. That doesn't mean he's very distant from us. He is close enough to hear you. Uh, we can reach him uh, in this place. He is just, God is just a prayer away. Right? 
Uh, it's beautiful how Solomon puts it. He says, God sees and hears you. Right? He says, God sees and he hears you. Okay. Yeah. May your eyes be open. All right? And hear the prayer that your prayer, that your servant prays. In a sense, okay, so he prays, may your eyes be open and then hear the prayer of your servant. So in a sense, his eyes are open and his ears are open constantly. God's uh, eyes and ears are open constantly, night and day. So we can never fully understand, not only fully comprehend God in all his, his, his fullness, but we can, catch, we can get hold of God in prayer. Right? We can speak with God. Uh, when we seek Him, He is right here seeing and hearing us. And that's prayer. That's the privilege of prayer we have with this God who is so majestic, so powerful, omnipresent God. We seek Him and we find Him. And what did Solomon pray about? That God forgives the people when they turn to Him. That's the main thrust of his prayer. Right? He says, uh, Okay, no, I think the slide is a bit off. I'm, my, my apologies. Lah. He says uh, in verse 30, right? Hear from heaven your dwelling place, and when you hear, Lord, forgive. He did not ask for things. He didn't ask for things. He prayed for mercy. Solomon asked uh, for that which is spiritual, that which is most important. So he seeks God's forgiveness. Solomon asked God to help the people in the different uh, occasions of needs, and four out of the six prayers right, has to do with Israel's sin that we see in, from verse 8 uh, to 33 to 50. It talks about uh, Israel's sin. All ah, right, correct, that's the one. Right, uh, he's asking for forgiveness for the different paths, for different peoples, for different occasions, for different needs. These are not occasions. Huh? I mean, see, asking for forgiveness is not, it's not occasions of despair, you know. Say, Lord, oh, I'm not God, I've, I've sinned, so there's no more hope for me. No. When asking for forgiveness, it is out of hope. Hope that the sins will be forgiven. And that is how Solomon prays. Praying uh, for mercy, knowing that God will forgive. So God hears the prayers of a penitent soul, a repentant heart. Restoration is possible and forgiveness is available. So my encouragement is to turn back and repent and receive God's forgiveness. And interesting how Pastor Glenn uh, let us just like that, right? Forgiveness and repent. We need that in our lives, repentance. Solomon prays for that which is important. People can come to the temple uh, seeking God for all kinds of things. But what is truly most important has to do with our relationship with God. So, approach God with a repentant heart. We are called to approach God uh, with sincerity and repentance, recognizing our need for forgiveness and understand the scope of God's mercy. God's forgiveness is not limited to specific scenarios in our lives, right? so it's for specific areas, but extends to all who turn to Him with a repentant heart, no matter their situation. Again, as I mentioned, I met two of my friends, right? Uh, another one was not, not my youth, but together we grew up. He came to Christ about a couple of years later, but much older than me. He was a very good worship leader. I loved the way he led worship in my home church. A very good singer. He led worship very nice, very vibrant. Person. And even at one time, uh, in the church drama, Good Friday, he acted as Jesus Christ. Right? Very talented brother, and I love that brother very much, and very encouraging also to me in many ways. So I met him on, on, on Monday. Right? I met a very broken man. He called me and he wanted to meet me. He was very broken. Uh, his life was very bad to a point where he had a lot of issues with uh, wife and children. He was very lonely. To a point where he was just, couldn't, he was just struggling with what was going on in his life. And he had moved so far away from God. To the point, you know what, he went, he told me, I went to see a medium. And the medium told me to bathe in this flower and all that. Then he did that at home, you know. When I heard that, I was so heartbroken. I said, Lord, how far he has fallen away from you. I didn't give him much advice. I only said, brother, it is time for you to return to God's love. This time. He was struggling. But then I told him, hey, Turning back to God is only a prayer away. You don't need to beg, you don't need to do much things. You know. Just repent, turn to Him, and He will forgive your sins. And that's all you need to do. You know, friends, our sin needs to be dealt, dealt with, right? His sin wasn't something that happened overnight, you know. It was cumulative, right? It happened over time, and that's why He ended up where He was. 
But this week has been okay. But our sins need to be dealt with, even the smallest and slightest one. Solomon understands that this is most important. He asks for nothing that is physical or material because he already has everything. It's all about living a, a life in obedience to God and His will. So take good care of our relationship with God, my friends. Make time for the Lord every day. Don't take it for granted. Pray that we will all grow closer in our walk with, uh, with Jesus. That alone matters in, in life. And remember God's faithfulness and seek His forgiveness always. And as uh, the worship team comes up, right? Yeah, sure. See, the dedication of, uh, of Solomon's temple as described in 1 Kings 8 uh, provides a very deep understanding of God's faithfulness and uh, the necessity of forgiveness, the need for forgiveness, and the boundless nature of his presence. As we reflect on this passage, let us recognize and acknowledge God's faithfulness, just as Solomon did. We should acknowledge God's role in our lives and trust in his promises. And seek for God's forgiveness, right? Seek forgiveness with a sincere heart. We are called to approach God with, uh, with repentance, understanding the comprehensive nature of His forgiveness. And then embrace the uncontainable presence of God. We must remember that God, while, is, while God is beyond physical limitations, He is always accessible to us through prayer. We always have access to Him. And may we, like Solomon, dedicate our lives to honouring God, seeking His forgiveness and embracing the limitless uh, nature of His presence. And as uh, the worship team leads us in a time of prayer, with our eyes closed and our hearts open, I want us to take this time to remember God's faithfulness, to acknowledge, to recognise His faithfulness over our lives. And even over this church, over CCR, even in the midst of challenges and struggle, we see God's faithfulness. I want to encourage you to see that. And also to come before God with a repentant heart. Our sins need to be dealt with. Just like Solomon pleaded and asked God for mercy, maybe we also do that and say, Lord, forgive me. If there is anything in your heart that is hindering you from having that intimate relationship with this amazing God, then may I encourage you to take this time to confess your sins. No matter how small or big, even no matter how impossible you think it is, but come before God with a repentant heart. Seek His forgiveness and He will forgive you as you seek His mercy. Thank you, Jesus.